If you've got your Bibles, please, can you turn with me to um, the second chapter of John's Gospel, John chapter 2. And um, the title of my message today, um, I didn't realize that so many from Teen Challenge were going to be here. And so um, the title of my message is 909 Bottles of Wine. (laughs) So I reflected afterwards, that maybe isn't the best (laughs) title. (laughs) But hopefully you will see, guys, where I'm going and will rejoice um, at the end of the message. But let's read the Word of God together. Um, On the third day, John chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? Or what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And so they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And so they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had, come, which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom. And he said to them, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. And this beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Canaan of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And the Lord will bless the public reading of his word. John's gospel is very different from the other three Gospels, the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because those Gospels, the synoptics, give kind of like an overview of Christ's life, chronologically, as it were. John's Gospel, however, is different. It's far more symbolic than that, and it's written as the last of the four Gospels towards the end of the first century. And in it, what John is doing is he is clearly setting out his stall that Jesus is far more than a man. In fact, that Jesus is God. You see, what was beginning to happen in that second generation of Christians at that time was that there was a heresy beginning to seep into the church that uh, Jesus was a man who received the Holy Spirit at his baptism, and then the Holy Spirit left at his death. And John sets out to dispel that myth And he very clearly throughout the gospel continually points to the deity of Jesus Christ. And so right from the get-go, very famously, John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so John is far less concerned about the historic order of events and far more concerned about making this point about the deity of Christ. And he uses a lot of symbolism to do it. And so, for example, Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels turns the tables over at, towards the end of his ministry prior to his Passion Week, prior happens in that time. But John takes that event and he transplants it right into chapter 2 here to the beginning of his gospel. And the reason why he does that is to make this point. He puts it alongside or juxtaposes it alongside the wedding in Cana at the beginning that we've just read and the turning of the tables of the temple at the end of that passage. What is John doing? He, he is saying this, I want you to understand that when Christ comes, he crum, comes to give you a banquet and a wedding and joy and life. And you need to contrast that with the dead and corrupt religion that's in the temple. And so John does all sorts of symbolic things like that. He's into numbers. He loves numbers. Um, There are seven miracles in the book of John, in the Gospel of John. Um, Eight, if you count the resurrection. And um, of course, seven's a great number, isn't it? If you know uh, numerology, Manly just smiles and laughs at me. But Jim and I, we love numbers, don't we, Jim? And um, 
a number is the perfect number. It's the, the number of completeness and wholeness. And, and so John gives seven miracles in his gospel. He gives um, seven discourses in his gospel that Jesus gives. He gives seven I am statements in the gospel. And of course, any New Testament scholar or Old Testament scholar, sorry, would tell you that I am has very significant meaning because in the Old Testament, Moses encountered God and he said, who will I send? Who will I tell sent me? What's your name? And God reveals his identity to Moses back then as I am, as Yahweh. And so Jesus seven times in the gospel of John reveals his character and his nature with seven I am statements. I am the bread of life, chapter six. I am the light of the world, chapter eight. I am the door and the good shepherd in chapter 10. I am the resurrection and the life, chapter 11. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life in chapter 14. And I am the true vine in chapter 15. Of course, at the end of chapter eight, he just comes out and he says it. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Of course, they knew exactly what he was meaning because they pick up stones to kill him. It wasn't his time at that moment. And so from Jesus' own lips comes this statement of identity saying, I am Yahweh, I am God. Hmm. Now, I give you all of that by way of introduction because in our reading today about Jesus' first miracle uh, at the wedding in Cana, we're going to see God at work. Chapters 2 to 11, known as the book of signs, are where the seven miracles actually happen. And John's unique to the other gospel writers in this as well. He uses a different Greek word to describe miracles. And the synoptic gospels, the Greek word that is used is dunamis, where we get dynamite for, from, all right? So it's, it's mighty, miraculous power is, is what the, the uh, synoptic gospels use. But John uses a different word in the Greek. He uses this word semeon, and, and, and basically it means a sign. In other words, these seven miracles are more than powerful, miraculous works. They are a sign that points towards something more. These signs. So at the end, in John chapter 20, verse 30, he Right says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Not more than these seven, in other words. But these are written, why? That you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The miracle at the wedding is given to us then as a sign that we will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. That we may have life in his name. That's why John writes it down. And oh, by the way, in case you're not getting it, this Jesus is far more than simply the Son of God. He is God. Amen. So the miracle of turning water into wine, it's actually unique to this gospel. It's not recorded in the other three, but it's well known. Probably not the most famous or significant of Christ's miracle in, in our eyes, maybe. It's good, of course, but, you know, it's, it's a great party trick. <laughs> um, but raising Lazarus from the dead, that was a miracle. Now, come on. That, that was a miracle. Walking on the water, that, that was a serious miracle. Feeding the 5,000 Oh, he's getting in the groove right now. So what's going on if he's only recording seven miracles, seven signs? Why does he start with like a party trick, as it were? Why does he start with something that seems to be less powerful? Well, of course, what John is doing is he's doing something very significant. And you've got to read the text. You've got to understand what's going on here because we see it at the end of this reading that he's, he's revealing his glory. God is revealing his glory. And he starts with a wedding after his introductory chapter. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And we walked with him. We've seen him. We've touched him. His first thing that he says in the story is a wedding. He brings us to a wedding. Interesting. Almost the last thing that he talks about in the book of Revelation is a wedding. 
isn't it? It's a wedding. And so John starts and ends his writings with this picture of what God in the form of Jesus Christ comes to do for us. He comes to bring us into this place of celebration, into this place of life, into this place of joy. That's what he's about. The last verse in our reading, we read this. This, the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed in in Galilee, he thus revealed his glory. I love this. And his disciples put their faith in him. I bet you they did. Where glory is doxa there, where we get the word doxology from. It's a lovely little word. And it means glory. And, and things can be glorious. Like we, we see glorious things in our world round about us. They, this word describes magnificence. It describes excellence and preeminence and dignity and grace. That's what doxa is about. But when it's used to describe God, Strong says this, is that doxa is the ultimate destination of all glory. And in God, all of glory resides. And so when Christ peels back in this miracle and reveals who he is to his disciples, he's peeling back his identity and they see and they believe because they see God. They see God. This is far more than a party trick or an illusion. God is pointing to something bigger. Now, the chapter begins with a time reference. Look at verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place. The third day in, in Jewish custom was the day that weddings traditionally take place. And that, there's a reason for that. I don't know whether you knew this or, or not. I found it out when I was preparing this. But they generally take place on a Tuesday on the third day because it's the third day in creation that God blesses and says it was good twice. Only once in the creation story in Genesis chapter 1 does God say it was good twice. That's on the third day, Tuesday. And so for the Jewish people, they would get married on a Tuesday. The celebration would happen because it was a, a day of double blessing. It was a day, a great day to have a new beginning. But weddings back then were more significant. We'll come to that in a minute. But for apprentices of Jesus on the third day, well, it has another meaning for us, doesn't it? The third day means something more significant than simply a double blessing because for the disciples of Christ, the third day points to when Jesus rose from the dead. When he conquered death and hell and sin. And so we gather every Sunday to remember the cross. We sing about his death and his resurrection to new life. The third day is why we're here. And because there was a third day in this story, what we see is this, there's going to be another wedding. <laughs> And Jesus is, is the bridegroom. And you and I, guys, we struggle with this, don't we? We're the bride. Come on. We're the bride. Revelation 19. We're the bride arrayed in white. Glorious. Waiting for the bridegroom to come. Now Mary was invited to this wedding. Verse 2 says this, Jesus and his disciples had also been invited. Now, we're not told whose wedding it was. We don't know. Cana looked it up in the map. It's about 10 miles from Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. Um, but by this stage in the story, he had already started his ministry. He's bringing his disciples with him to the wedding. And so he's already well known in Galilee. He would already have been um, you know, healing the sick and casting out demons. There would already have been miracles and so the, this couple and their families, there's obviously some connection to Mary. We don't know what it is. But they, I think they think to themselves, you know what? Mary's son is the rabbi Jesus. I wonder if he would come to our wedding and bless him. And so the invite is sent and the famous son and his friends come. Now, what's the application? Well, there's a couple of things that this tells us. Firstly, it tells us that Jesus is someone that this couple wanted to be at their wedding. <laughs> Back then, as it is even today, weddings can be major stress events for everyone involved. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
weddings, there's this expectation that are on them. It's not simply about receiving a gift, but in that culture at that time, it was more important that you would provide and pay for a celebrations. And by the way, weddings back then didn't last for a day the way they do here. They lasted for an entire week. I met any Nigerians in the house? Come on, the Nigerians. I know you guys. How many weddings do you have? Three weddings, minimum. Up in Aberdeen with lots of Nigerians. No, they don't get married once, they don't get married twice, they get married three times. They just turn up and say, we're here to partay. Let's get married again. What well, was like that back in that culture as well? The wedding celebration would last for an entire week. And so when you were going to invite your family and friends, you needed to be really careful and clued in that you were going to have enough food and drink for a party to last for an entire week. In fact, this was really serious in this culture. In fact, because what could happen, I read one commentary, true this, that if you went to a wedding and it was a washout and it wasn't a great celebration and you brought a gift, you could legally take the bride and groom to court to get your gift back. There was this expectation that what would happen is that if you went and you gave a wedding gift, you would be there and you would have a blast, man. You would, you would enjoy yourself. There would be eating and drinking and dancing and joy. And what would happen is if the food and the drink ran out and the party started to go south, as it were, then that was a big deal. Because instead of goodwill, there would be grumbling. Instead of, you know, wishing the couple the best, what would happen is they'd start to gossip and they say, what sort of party is this? We had to, you'll never guess that party that we had to endure. They didn't even have enough wine. And what the, even the worst thing that could happen is that people would go and leave the party early. Because instead of your marriage starting out well and being blessed, your relationship, your marriage would start out with gossip and shame and embarrassment. So that's all going on here. Yeah. All right. Mary sees something happening over the table and over the tables and she sees that the stewards who are pouring wine out <laughs> shrug their shoulders and like this. There's no more wine. We don't know what point in the celebration this happens. But she leans over to Jesus and says, they've got no more wine. And she knows the serious of, seriousness of what's going on. I can imagine the bride and groom, maybe the mom and dad, sitting there and the anxiety levels are beginning to rise. People are maybe thinking, well, the party's just getting going and they've run out of wine. What sort of show is this? Hmm. Jesus, they've run out of wine. Do something. Do something. Maybe... She could see, Mary saw the, the faces on some of the guests. Imagine if this goes south. The celebration could turn sour very quickly. Jesus says to her, dear woman, why do you involve me? What a great thing to say to your mom. Dear woman, what the heck's going on there, Jesus? Dear woman, why do you involve me? No, I, I love this. Why? Because it seems in the text that Jesus doesn't actually want to help. My time has not yet come, he says. Dear woman, leave me alone. It's almost there, written in the subtext. And so, but then he goes on and he does this amazing miracle. So what's going on here? Let me tell you what I think is going on here. See, Jesus never responds out of humanity asking him to do something. He only responds to what he hears his father say. Watch this. Now, John says this a couple of times. John 5, 30. I can do nothing, Jesus say, by myself. I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 8, 28. He says, I do nothing on my own, but, seek, but speak exactly what the Father has taught me. He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, because I always do what pleases him. 
Jesus acted here not on the say-so of humanity, no matter how much he loved that humanity, but he did this miracle because he only did what he heard his father say for him to do. Now, think about that for a moment. That means that this miracle is the father's will. This means that this miracle is not prompted. Uh, he has his emotional heartstrings pulled by his mom. No, it comes from an altogether different source. The miracle doesn't happen to spare the blushes of the bridal families or to please his mother. Jesus performs this miracle because it's the will of the Father. Now, let me just land this point with you because this is so neat when you grasp it. If you ever have any doubt that God is for you, then read this text. If you have any doubt that God wants to bless you, then read this story. If you think that Christianity is about making you feel bad about yourself or binding you up with legalistic rules or making you feel shame for feeling, then read this story because it's the Father's will to bless and to bless you abundantly. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says this, I have come that they may have life and life in all of its fullness. The father in the Old Testament says this, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to bless you, to give you hope and a future. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. 